Joining me this week is an author and professor in the ecology and evolution departments at the University of Chicago. He's also the creator of the aptly titled Why Evolution is True website and has written over 115 scientific papers. Jerry Coyne, welcome to the Rubin Report. Good to be here. 115 scientific papers. How do you even have time to be here? Well, that's not actually a lot compared to some of the biggies in the field. I mean, what I'm proud of is that I worked on all those papers. If you're head of a big lab in a major university and you have a lot of postdocs and graduate students, you just tend to slap your name in their papers. So a really big guy in that field can get six, 700 papers in their lifetime. But the work that they've actually done on them has been only to get the funding and you know, <laughs> slap their name on it. So actually, 115 is a good number for me. So 115 that you've actually, actually written, on. not just put the stamp on. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. yeah. If, and if my I, goal was to do two a year through my whole professional career. So that's actually exceeded that. So there you go. You know, so uh, if you had to pick one that you're most proud of, uh, I would probably be. That's a tough choice, you know. Uh, it'd probably be my book. It's not a paper, but it's a book, but it's called Speciation. It's my very first book. It's a technical book, and it's a summary of all... I work on the origin of species, mm -hmm. which was Darwin's original problem that he didn't solve because he didn't know what a species was. But, <laughs> so this book, which is written, I think, in, uh, to, in uh, 2004, I believe, is uh, the distillation of my thinking over 30 years of, of speciation. It's been very popular and sort of regarded as a classic in the field, and I think that's the work I'm proudest of and best known for. Yeah, so for people that know nothing about just how scientific papers are mm -hmm. done in general, so basically you come up with a theory, right? And mm -hmm. then what, what's the process? I mean, you go, I gotta write 20 pages about this, I gotta write 1,000 pages, who, you know, I gotta get researchers to figure this out. Like, what's actually happening? For well, someone that knows a, nothing about this. Yeah, well, the paper is a culmination of a long process. And for most scientists, including me, I think you don't, do a piece of research with the idea of writing a paper, because you never know how it's going to turn out. If you know how your research is going to turn out, you wouldn't be doing research <laughs> right. in the first place. So, right. um, and a lot of, yeah, so you'd always start with an idea and a question. And what I like to do is have a question that, if I did the research, and I worked on fruit flies, Drosophila, yep. evolutionary genetics, um, my idea was to design experiments so the results would always be clean cut. And then if they were, then you'd write a paper. But typically it takes, for me at least, two to three years worth of sitting at the bench under the microscope before you get the answer. But then you're doing several of these experiments at the same time. And at the end, if you have a good result, then you write it up and you send it to one of the several journals in your field. And you always try to get it into the best possible journal because that's the way one makes one's career. And then sure. it gets refereed by um, two, or, well, the editor has to decide first of all whether it's worthwhile to get this thing looked at. Mm -hmm. you know? And in the big name journals like Nature and Science, um, they can reject a paper within 10 minutes. I mean, have I had that happen? You Is send that the paper right? online, they'll just glance at the abstract and say, not for us. And, really? You know, that's quite disparaging. Yeah. <laughs> but more often than not, they'll send it out to two or three reviewers who are anonymous, and they'll, they'll write like reports of varying length about the the paper, and this is the way science is good because they're anonymous, and so they feel that they're free to criticize anything that they want, and there's there's no strictures. They're not worried that you're going to hold it against them, and um, so you get some pretty strong criticism. And you have to have a thick skin in science. I mean, you have to get used to criticism. In fact, you have to welcome it. Because, yeah. <laughs> well, you have to accept facts. That must. That's not a very uh, a thing that we do a lot of in twenty. Yeah, and I think that's the reason why science and skepticism go so well together, because skepticism is ingrained. It's part of the toolkit of science. And whenever you write a paper, for example, or an experiment, you, first of all, when you do the experiment, you ask, well, what could go wrong here? Am I doing everything right? Is there another possible interpretation? And then when you write the paper, you have to say, well, you know, what is another possible interpretation of the results? Is there anything I did wrong that could be glommed on third view? So you're always looking over your own shoulder knowing that everybody else is going to be doing it too. And um, so that instills a climate of doubt and skepticism, which I think is why American scientists, scientists in general, are so much more atheistic than the general public. I yeah. think 40% of American scientists are even more atheists compared to like, you know, two to 6% of the general population. Yeah, so we'll get more to atheism and yeah, compatibilism sure. and all that in a little bit. But I'm curious, what do you think there is about the scientific mind or the skeptical mind that pushes you in this direction? I mean, when you, when you were five, were you already asking the questions that couldn't be answered? Uh, not really, but I know exactly the moment when 
Well, I was always wanting to be a scientist because my dad was an animal lover. He took me to the zoos. He bought me the little golden book of dinosaurs and things uh -huh. like that. So when I went off to college, I was pretty well determined to be a biologist. But I can remember the moment I became an atheist precisely, and it happened within a period of five minutes. Nobody ever <laughs> believes this story, but it's true. I was, I think it was in 1969 that the Beatles' Sgt. Pepper, Lonely Hearts Club Band album came out, and I was listening to it for the first time in my parents' living room on their you know, uh, LP player, and I was sitting on the couch, nobody was home, and for some reason, and it had nothing to do, I think, with the music, besides the fact that it may have created a particular mindset in me, I suddenly realized that everything that I'd ever been taught about the existence of God, and I had been raised as a secular Jew, I don't know if you were as yeah. well, but, yeah. which is pretty close to being an atheist, but um, everything that I had ever been taught about God was wrong, that there was no evidence for any of the stuff that I've been fed my whole life. Now, mm -hmm. I wasn't deeply religious, but I never doubted that there was a divine being. All of a sudden I realized, well, you know, what's the evidence for that? Instantly, I mean, it just came to me. And it just seemed obvious at that moment. Yeah, at that moment, and then for, um, for about five minutes thereafter, I had a really bad time, because I realized, well, you know, I'm gonna die and I'm not gonna go anywhere. <laughs> There's no heaven. Um, yeah. I started sweating, I remember that, and then, Somehow it passed and I was fine with that. And I accepted that. And ever since that moment, I've never believed in God. You know. there, there's such an interesting piece of that that it had something to do with listening to the Beatles yeah. in a weird way. You know, so that music maybe gave your mind the space to suddenly have a strange revelation that you hadn't had yeah, It's before. possible. And I, you know, I wish I could remember the song on the album I was listening to. Yeah. I and mean, it would be nice if it was a day in the life. But uh, <laughs> You should just listen to the album all day long and see what revelations you have now. When's yeah. the last time you listened to the album? That would, yeah. that would be something. I actually saved that album because it was so instrumental in my life, so I still have it. But, of course, the LPs, you can't play them anymore unless you have the special technology. So I just keep it as a sort of memory piece. Yeah, there you go. All right, so there's a whole bunch I want to talk to you. We're going to talk about sure. speciation and, and all that stuff. But let's start with evolution, because okay. your, uh, your website, Why Evolution is True. Mm -hmm. Tell me, Jerry, why is evolution true? Well, it's because there's the confluence of so many lines of evidence that point to the fact. I mean, well, you got to realize what evolution is. So. I, I divide it up into five parts. Um, that first of all, that evolution happens, and by evolution we mean that populations change their genetic constitution over time. It doesn't mean that an individual evolves or a population all of a sudden changes itself into something else. It means that over time it gradually changes its genetic composition. So that's part one. The second part is in, uh, included in that, which is it's a gradual process. It takes you know hundreds of millions of years to make substantial change. The third part is that there's not only change within a lineage, but there's also splitting of lineages. So we started with uh, sort of Ur species, probably about four billion years ago, the universal common ancestor. And now there's estimates of anywhere from seven to 50 million years of, seven to 50 million species on Earth. So there has to have been this multiple ramifying process. That's different from just change mm -hmm. within lineage. It has to, and that's what I worked on my whole career, this actual splitting. Um, and that's the origin of species. Right. You start with one, you get you know, 50 million, how did it happen? And that's the problem that Darwin actually made no progress on whatsoever. Right, so let's pause there for a second. Okay. So what causes the splitting? Uh, that's a good question. Um, and it really wasn't begun to be understood until about the 1930s. So that's you know, about 80, 90 years after Darwin had started publishing his book. Um, what we think, and there's lots of evidence for this, there's several ways it can happen, but the most common way is that you have populations of a species, because you know, even the human species is not distributed continuously over the planet, mm -hmm. and then some of those populations become geographically isolated from one another um, by mountain ranges, simply by distance, mm -hmm. um, by migration to a distant island like the birds that land in the Galapagos, and once that there's some barrier to gene flow um, to interchange between these species, they begin diverging evolutionarily because they're going to live in different environments. No two places on Earth are exactly the same. Natural selection will be acting differently to adapt these things yeah. to their environment. Different mutations will occur because it's a rare process and a random one. So and it's a confluence of everything, actually. Location, weather, yeah. the subset of people or, yeah. or the subset of animals or organisms. It's everything, really, that's sort of adding to the primordial stew that then causes the difference. Yeah, so what happens is that they begin diverging, and also the initial, I mean, no two groups of individuals and species are genetically the same. So you have different raw material, you have different environments, and you have different 
forces of natural selection that causes these populations to begin to evolve on different pathways, each one according to the straight Darwinian lineage process. But now you have two of them doing it, and you get to the point where they become so different genetically that were they to come back together again in the same area, they would be unable to produce fertile hybrids. And that could happen wow. in a variety of ways. They don't like each other because they look different. Mm -hmm. They evolve. That happens in birds a lot. Or they could be physiologically different to the point where they could mate, but the hybrids would be sterile and viable. Like the classic example of that is the mule, which is a hybrid between the donkey and the horse, mm -hmm. which were, had a common ancestor, but evolved to the point where they're, they're, um, the zygote doesn't develop properly. Right. Um, so a could, donkey and a horse can't do it. Is that? Uh, they're a different species. Yeah. yeah. So, so that's not, uh, we can't mix that up. Yeah. So when, I mean, so in short, you know, geographic isolation causes the impetus for genetic isolation through differential evolution to the point where if two things are unable to produce a fertile hybrid when they come back together again then they're regarded as different species so the process usually requires some kind of geographic isolation there are other parameters of it other forms of it which are both faster and don't require isolation but this is the classic way that species originate darwin didn't hit on this i mean he there's sort of hints in it but um, because he didn't know what a species was. And in order to be able to understand this process, you have to understand the importance of the reproductive isolation as the criterion for being species. They simply cannot mate with each other and produce hybrids. And once you realize that that's the explanation for all these, you know, diversity of nature, then you can begin to figure out how it happens. Right. So when you say Darwin didn't know what a species was, I, I understand what you just said there, but for the layperson that would hear that, they'd say, well, wait a minute, how could Darwin not know what a species is? Well, it's because, well, first of all, Darwin didn't know any genetics. So, you know, the species concept is an explicitly genetic one. It, is, it means two things are different species if they're unable to combine their genes in a way that they could move between from one species to another. Um, Darwin didn't know that, and it hadn't, it wasn't really worked out until the 1930s and the 1940s, the so-called modern synthesis of evolutionary biology. So he basically settled on the definition that a lot of people think is true, um, erroneously, which is that a species is what a competent naturalist calls a species. Right. And back in those days, people were calling the different human gr ethnic groups different species. Mm -hmm. I mean, even in the United States, in the slavery days, blacks and whites were regarded as members of different species. Well, that's probably untrue because they can mate with one another and produce fertile hybrids. It happens mm -hmm. all the time. Right. But, but, you know, because they look different, um, people would say, well, okay, they're different species. It was only when they hit on the genetic... Um, criterion for what species are that people were able to begin understanding, well, how do we get this kind of divergence to the point where things are reproductively incompatible? I should add that the different human ethnic groups were probably on the, originally on the path to becoming different species because they lived in different parts of the world, they were subject to different selection pressures, probably dark pigmented skin is some kind of reaction to living in a hot environment. Mm -hmm. We don't really understand that. But because humans are so mobile and they invented things like bicycles and transportation, this process of divergence was stopped in its tracks. Huh. And so now we're, instead of, you know, having different species of humans, and we did at one point, um, five or six of them living in the same time, but that was millions of years yeah. ago. We have what we call... Wait, those, so those five or six, six types, we're talking about like Neanderthals? Yeah, well, no, Neanderthals, or, that's a good question actually yeah. about Neanderthals. People say, well, they're different species from humans, and if the formally the taxonomy is no, they're called Homo sapiens sapiens and Homo sapiens neanderthalensis. And the last word is, means subspecies difference, so they're regarded as ethnic groups. And the reason that any biologist would say they're the same species is because we have evidence that they actually not only made it with each other, but that some of the genes from the Neanderthals came into the human genome. So you can have your genome sequenced and find what percentage of Neanderthal genes you have. That's proof that somewhere back, you know, 100,000 years ago or less, these two groups mated with one another and were able to produce fertile hybrids. And when that happens, then they're called members of the same species. Right, so technically, if humans had not learned to travel as much as they have and you know get past the ba natural barriers that exist in mountains and all that stuff technically right now we could have different types of species 
of humans? Is that? Yeah, well, I guess they wouldn't all be human. Well, they would all be human, right? They're yeah. Well, you, well, you call them hominins. That's right. the technical okay. name. Yeah. We'd have different species of hominins, um, but probably not now because remember, humans left Africa only about sixty to one hundred thousand years ago, and that's only, you know. Um, two or three thousand generations or so. And that's not very long. Um, typically, an animal speciation takes a million years or so. So 60,000 years is, is less nothing. than a tenth of that. So, you know, we'd have to have remained isolated for much longer than we did. People fail to realize that, although, you know, human ethnic groups look different from one another, that we're actually quite young. And that's reflected in the fact that we have this profound genetic similarity underlying the, the physical differences which led other earlier anthropologists to call us different races and even different species. So. Yeah. How much of this is humbling to you to, to study this? Because you're talking about this, these long periods of time where so much is happening, does it make sort of the minutia of just a regular life seem kind of silly when you're, when you're studying some really powerful stuff over a long period? Well, um, probably the answer is no, because evolution of biologists are humans, yeah. too. I mean, you should ask that question to somebody like Lawrence Krauss, who yeah. works on billions of years ago. I think I did ask him that kind yeah, of question. I think yeah, I saw your interview yeah. with him where he <laughs> talked about, you know, the, and I, a recent, uh, <coughs> excuse me, um, interview he did as well, where he talked about the awe and the spirituality that comes with science. And yes, that is definitely true. Um, I don't think evolution of biology instills in one um, a different kind of wonder that it would instill in a cosmologist or somebody studying physics. It might instill a different kind of wonder in somebody like me than in a biochemist who's studying one particular molecule. Because we get to look over the whole panoply of time. Sure. And we have the advantage of, of being able to marvel at this simple naturalistic process, the simple sorting of genes which occurs mindlessly but is directional in a way that's conditioned by the environment. That starting with an, you know just chemicals about four billion years ago has led to things that are incredibly complex. Even a single bacteria, if you look at a diagram of what's going on inside that bacterium in terms of its metabolism, and every classroom has a biology classroom has a diagram of the Krebs cycle and things on the wall. All that stuff has evolved, um, and so you know it's just it's just an amazing thing. I it's, mean, so is that the real beauty of science? That there are probably things that you believe at the moment to be facts that ultimately someone could come around in twenty years and say, you know, coin miss this, and and it could change what what you accept right now. Yeah, I'm not sure that's the beauty of science, <laughs> but that's <laughs> or the, is that the nightmare? Is that well, the nightmare? So, well, of the, 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 the personal nightmare is that what you did might be shown to be wrong. Yeah. And if you're a big enough person, and Richard Dawkins tells a story about a guy who was wrong his whole life. Some guy in a seminar showed him up to be wrong, and he went up and shook his hand and said, Sir, thank you very much. My whole life I've been wrong about this. Well, that kind of magnanimous attitude is very rare in it's science. Right. <laughs> you know, we don't make a lot of money as scientists, but our currency is reputation. And so if you're wrong, you know, you lose your reputation. If you're wrong and you admit it, then you gain a little bit of your reputation back. But the beauty of science is that it's self-correct in nature. I mean, that doesn't mean that every truth we have in science is a provisional truth. People always say that, you know, we don't hit on absolute truth in science. And that is true, because there's no bell that goes off when you make a finding that says, okay, ding, 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 this right. is it. You know, it's, um, it could be possible that evolution might be falsified in the future. And I've made a list somewhere. You're going to have to my... change the name of your website then. Yeah, well, yeah <laughs> I don't know what they call it. But I, I'm... Anthony Grayling, the philosopher, has pointed out that for some things, we're about as close to absolute truth as we can get. We know that the formula for a water molecule, the normal one, is H2O. We know that DNA is a double helix. Um, you know, we know that the planets orbit around the sun. It would be an extraordinary finding that would make us change our mind about that. So Grayling would say that science does indeed find truth to the point where you would bet your life savings that something is not going to change in the future. Yeah, so. do you think that's the ultimate goal of being a human is to find that absolute truth? Well, to being a scientist. Well, certainly scientist. to a scientist, but, but really yeah. just for, for humans in general. I mean, the quest for truth, that really is, is kind of well, what people, it's all about. Well, a lot of people right? don't want truth. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you must be aware of this. I mean, yeah. more than half of Americans, well, 42% 40, of Americans are young earth creationists, okay? And another 31% accept evolution, but they think God guided the process, which is a view for which there is not the slightest bit of evidence. 
only 19% of Americans are one in five, accept evolution the way I teach it or the way Richard Dawkins teaches it. This is a purely naturalistic process, which is the great wonder of evolution. Yeah. So, you know, these people have access to the truth. Um, it's not as if Americans are woefully ignorant of how evolution works. We have Neil deGrasse Tyson, we have Ed Wilson, you know, we have, um, we had Carl Sagan, mm -hmm. we have David Attenborough, we have Stephen Jay Gould. We have all these people pointing out over and over again about evolution and yet Americans are resistant yeah. to that. They don't want the truth. As Jack Nicholson said, you can't you, handle yeah. the truth. <laughs> you know? Yeah, I, I find that really fascinating because I remember I saw, I was not really into all of this stuff really and at some point in college, I, uh, I've mentioned the story before, but I smoked a lot of pot and I went to see the movie Contact, which mm -hmm. was, it was the, novel, the only novel that Carl Sagan ever wrote, but I saw that first panorama of the universe, which is how the movie begins, mm -hmm. and it just blew my mind. And from that point forward, I read a bunch of his books. I started reading all these, you know, Dawkins and all of this stuff, and then it just awoke. So what's the best thing we can do to wake people up to this? Because I do think people want it, and yeah. they, they've sort of been tricked into the dumbening that we have going on. Yeah, a lot of it's indoctrination. Um, I'm not sure people want it because the implications and the facts about evolution are not only, I mean, they're anti-theistic, basically, yeah. and they lead on to become an atheist. I have a whole lecture on this. Um, so do you really want to know that when you die, you're not gonna go anywhere? <laughs> do you really want to know that you're not the special object of God's creation? Do you want to know that you don't have a soul that's immortal in your body. And all of these things are implications of evolutionary biology and they're discomforting to people. Um, so where do you get the comfort then? Uh, the, the quotidian things that you do every day. And also the pleasure, in my case, of studying evolutionary biology itself. We have to come to terms with the fact that, you know, we're mortal, that we are the products of a mindless process. Um, that gave rise to all the other species. We're no different from any of them, except that we're highly cerebralized. Uh, the comfort comes from the things you do day to day. Um, I have to admit, it would be nice to live forever. I've made this, I posed this question to the readers on my website, would you like to be immortal? Mm -hmm. And uh, about three quarters of them say, no, you know, I'll be happy to die. I think they're lying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'd like to hang around and see what happens, but unfortunately, you know, the, Unlike all the other sciences, evolution is the one that has so many personal implications for humans' self-view of themselves, and that's why people reject it. So I'm not so sure that education is the way to do that. And that's why I wrote my first book was called Why Evolution is True. It says nothing about religion at all. It just says, here's all the different lines of evidence that give evidence for evolution. Embryology, the distribution of plants and animals on the surface of the earth, um, the fossil record, of course, the existence of vestigial organs, the way we develop, all of this stuff points to the same thing. It's as true as any theory that we could say in science, like the theory of atoms, the germ theory of disease. Um, and I guess I naively hoped that once this book was out, America was going <laughs> you thought to that was a it. sea change. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, you know, the, the, the statistics which come from the Gallup organization show that Creationism has remained flat since 1982, between 40 and like 45 percent. So, despite the fact that you know there's so much more evidence for evolution now, especially with DNA sequencing, than we had in the 30 years ago, people are just as resistant to it as before. So, is that the crux of the problem more than anything else? Is that you're dealing in fact? You need science to prove things, and that's what you'll accept as truth. While the whole point of religion is to take the leap of faith, so there's nothing that you could do actually as a scientist to take someone that's willing to take take that leap. There's nothing you could do, right? Yeah, well, there's some people who are sufficiently open-minded that they will give up creationism, and when they do that, they usually give up their religious belief as well. And I get emails from them, but it's not like twenty a day. Right. <laughs> so you know what I've concluded? It. I mean, I have never met a creationist in my life, and I've met hundreds and thousands of them, who was not motivated by religion. Um, maybe one, this guy David Berlinski, who says he's, uh, I think he's a non-believing Jew like the rest of us, right. if you can even use such a term. Um, he's the only, uh, he's the only uh, person who's objected to evolution I've ever met who was not motivated by religion. So, so how is it not motivated by religion then? What well, else, what else just, could it be motivated by? He claims to see certain 
the same kinds of flaws in evolution that the intelligent design people see. Yeah. But he, the, the only difference between him and a straight intelligent designed creationist is he says, this is a technical problem with evolution and I don't, and it doesn't have anything to do with Jesus. The rest of these people, they, they raise these specious problems with evolutionary biology, and they are specious. But, you, but their other writings and, and their speeches let you know that they're really doing this because they think that evolution is a materialistic, naturalistic process that dethrones humans as the apotheosis of creationism. There's a lot of Jews in this space, and you've mentioned sort of secular Jews or yeah. Jews that not non-believers or something. Yeah. And Carl Sagan. I mean, we can go through the the yeah. amount of people. Um, what do you What do you think that is about? Is there something different about Judaism as a religion that has pushed people in that direction, or towards, pulled, towards or pulled people in that direction? Or or, yes. Yeah, well, I think both because yeah. there's a gajillion <clears throat> scientists and there's a gajillion secular. Yeah. Well, I remember when I graduated from college and went on to graduate school in, in evolution, my advisor gave me two books, one of which was the Handbook of Theoretical Population Genetics, and the other one was um, The Joys of Yiddish by Leo Rostin, because ah. there were so many Jews in evolution. I genetics. suspect that the latter one was the more fun one to read, probably. Yeah, it was. Well, <laughs> you know, Jews are highly overrepresented in academia, um, probably for two reasons. Um, first of all, that education is so much emphasized in that culture. Mm -hmm. um, and second of all, it's so close to atheism, particularly, you don't see Orthodox, many Orthodox Jews doing science. What you do is see Reformed Jews who become atheists, people like me, like Steven Weinberg, I mean, any number of them that, you know, already from the very beginning, and an important part of Judaism is constant argument and questioning. And also, you know, there's not that much belief in God. There's the old joke you probably heard of, what do you call a Jew who doesn't believe in God? And the answer is a Jew. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, Dave Silverman argues that you can't say you're an atheist Jew. I mean, yeah, we've had probably, that argument. I, I I don't see eye to eye to him on that. Yeah, neither do I. I mean, because I like to speak a little Yiddish. I like bagels. You know, when I see a guy in a fur hat and a beard, I feel some kind of genetic kinship yeah. with him. You, know? <laughs> you feel kinship? I feel like, well, I see those guys and I go, man, that has nothing to do with me. But I understand. Yeah, no, they, I agree. I think yeah. they're, they're deeply deluded. I mean, I'm like going, it's LA. It's 90 degrees. You're wearing a wool hat. I mean, what? <laughs> Yeah, I agree. I just there's something about a, I don't think you could be a cultural Catholic in the same way as you can be a cultural Jew, and I've never really figured out why that is. That we're the one religion, or right now we're ex-religionists, who still can claim that we're Jews because we feel a cultural connection with that. Right. There is religion. well because all, because it's sort of an ethnicity and a culture at the same time, where Christianity is more of a religion. I don't know. Yeah. If, are you familiar with Ali Rizvi, who yes. just who just wrote uh, the Atheist Muslim? Yes. And I think he's doing such, such an interesting thing with that because he's trying to take Islam or being a Muslim and do exactly what you're describing sort of, it sort of evolutionarily happened to Jews in, in a way. Yeah. And, and I think that's sort of a, it, it's a big task though, right? Yeah, I read his book, um, in fact I gave a blurb on the cover for it, but I can't remember if he actually was kind of pushed some kind of cultural version of Islam. In other words, you'd celebrate Eid, you'd fast during Ramadan even though you don't believe. Right. I've never known a Muslim to do that. Well, I, that's what I'm saying. I think yeah. he might be the one that's actually... Well, it's possible. I don't know. Um, you know, my message from that book was the same message that I and here Lee had in her latest book, which was to try to reform the faith from within, which I think is a futile task at this yeah. point in history. But, yeah. you know, I thought the book was quite good because the way he interwove his personal story um, with the tenets of the Quran, which are invidious and, you know, cause harm and stuff. So, yeah, it's a good book. So one of the questions I like asking all the atheists, and I've obviously had a lot of atheists on the show, and I am going to have some more believers, by the way, uh, because people are always saying, don't have enough believers, but I'm going to have some more believers coming on. But one of the things I like to ask is, for the average person that, that's not a scientist, just the average person that took that leap of faith, that is living their life, is happy, has a family, doing, doing whatever they do, do you think it really matters that, that they took that leap of faith? You mean that they became religious? Yeah. Uh, well, if, if they're doing no harm, if they're not trying to push it on anyone, any of that kind of stuff, do you think it really, I guess, it, like in the bones, does it really matter? Well, the operative phrase in what you said was, are they doing no harm? And how many religious people are not really doing any harm? Well, you can say that a lot of them are doing harm because they're enabling faith. In other words, they're, they're making a virtue of 
accepting things for that evidence. So that in and of itself would be well, damaging yeah, I mean, in a certain I would, I don't, I'm not going to be that hard on religion and say, well, yeah. that's always horrible. I can't yeah. really say, along with Christopher Hitchens, that religion poisons everything. There are some people, and but they're always the liberal religionists who do that. Um, one of the dangers, one of the greatest dangers of, of that kind of faith, even in its most you know, benign form, is that you teach it to your children. Mm -hmm. So right off the bat, you're teaching your children things for which there are no evidence. And that will lead them to, you know, not think so hard about, you know, whether do I, you know, do I really believe this stuff that I'm taught, or have I just swallowed it? But in the main, I think the mainstream religions, almost all of them, do harm in some ways. Um, you know, certainly Islam does, um, Judaism does, um, Christianity does. Um, just all the ones you can think of. Yeah, besides I mean, in, that, my, yeah. in my book, I consider the question, you know, is it, is it ever bad to have faith? And the only scenario I could really come up with was the dying grandmother scenario. So your grandmother's on her deathbed, she's about to die, she's deeply consoled by knowing that she's going to go to heaven. Yeah. You're not going to sit there and tell her, look, you know, you're not going anywhere. <laughs> Nobody would do that. So you let them have their faith. You don't try to disabuse them of it. But... You know, in general, given that faith doesn't, I don't think, and again, this is a difficult calculus to perform, but the question of whether religion is a net good or a net bad in today's world, I, I think it's a net bad. And to that extent, then, the less that people are religious, the better they are, um, the better a world will have, because the more likely they are to not trust in a deity to help themselves um, and the more likely they are to be a humanist and build a better society for themselves. My model for the kind of society that I think we should be aiming for is Scandinavia, where virtually everybody's an atheist. Right. And there's no faith at all, and there's no downside to that. So is, is there an inherent problem with America going that route because they're not nearly as multicultural as we are, where we have so many different competing ideas where they really have one set of people. It's changing a little bit now. Yeah. Um, but is there, could there be like a, an actual sort of literal reason that that, that couldn't work? Uh, you know, the question of why America is so much more religious than Europe is a difficult one. I don't think it really has to do, and again, I'm not a sociologist here, with the diversity of different ethnicities. I mean, why should it be true that we have an Irish Catholic over here and we have an Eastern European Jew here? Why does that prevent either of those groups from becoming more secular. Mm -hmm. I mean, do they somehow reinforce each other's faith? Well, they're antithetical to each other. Right. <laughs> you think that they might bring each other towards secularism, but that hasn't happened. I mean, I think the explanation, which I give in my latest book, Faith Versus Fact, is one that a lot of sociologists are hitting on, which is that the more dysfunctional a society is, the more religious it is. Mm -hmm. And you can look up index of dysfunctionality. Sociologists have constructed them, not for the purpose of doing down religion, but just to assess how dysfunctional they are. They include things like, you know, um, the degree of medical care, corruption, percentage of the population that's incarcerated, amount of crime, venereal disease, um, child mortality, and these can all be combined, combined into what we call a successful societies index. And you can plot that versus the religiosity of a country. And when you do that, you see that it goes down. The more religious the country is, the more dysfunctional it is. And it turns out that amongst like 34 or maybe it's 42 first world countries that were surveyed in this kind of study by Greg Paul, the U.S. was the most religious. Huh. We're the most religious first world country and we're also the most dysfunctional. <laughs> well, we're certainly the most dysfunctional. Yeah, right? and so, you know, Karl Marx had an explanation for that. I'm not a Marxist, but his explanation was, you know, um, I can't give his exact quote, you know, the religion is the opiate of the people, the yeah. heart of a heartless world. His point was that people turn to religion when they cannot turn to their own societies, to their own government for help. And you can see this in the United States when income inequality goes up and down over time, mm -hmm. religiosity follows a year after. So the more income inequality one year, the religiousness goes up the next year. So that shows that actually the, the dysfunctionality is causal to the religiosity. Yeah, so in a weird it. way, the best way to untie people from religion would be to give them better lives, yeah, well, whatever that means. I mean, yes. you know, get an economy that's functioning properly so that people have some money and can do the things they want, and they might untie themselves from some of this stuff. Yeah, and I think that's what's happened in Europe. I mean, they just did not need 
religion. And they and countries like Denmark and Sweden are functioning perfectly well. I mean, when people say we religion will always be with us. I just say, well, look at Scandinavia. And then people say, well, America is different. And I say, well, how is it different? It's different in the fact that we're more dysfunctional. So people. So getting back to evolution. Yeah. You asked me, you know, how would I want? How what's the best way to make people accept evolution? My first answer would be to get rid of religion, <laughs> because yeah. it's religion that prevents people from accepting evolution. If you're an atheist, you have no reason to oppose evolutionary biology. What, you know, be, the reason people oppose it is because it's, and so how do you get rid of religion? Well, this, the answer to that is you create a more egalitarian, more humanitarian, more secular humanist society. So my ultimate answer is, you know, how do you get people to accept evolution? Equalize income and give everybody health care. <laughs> that would be the sort of answer I would give to that. Equalize question. income meaning like, well, like not, a I mean, universal basic income? Or well, you, you know, just, in... just, just prevent this kind of society in which some people can get so wealthy. There was some statistic published today, I think, that, the, that eight people in the world have as much money as the lowest half of the whole entire population of Earth. Wow. I mean, there's something deeply wrong with that. Um, I'm not sure exactly how to do it, but social welfare programs are one way to do it. I don't think that we should, you know, make everybody have the same income. I mean, that's going to eliminate, in my mind, you know, the incentive to to innovate. A lot of people's incentives come from wealth and things like that. But there's got to be something done about at least being able to help the people in the lower half of society. And when that's done, and that's what's being done in Sweden and Denmark and Norway, they don't have equalized incomes there, but they do have, you know, um, free health care, they have good schools, they have um, for academics, and everybody, in fact, they have uh, paternity leave and maternity leave, and it's equal for males and females. And that's the kind of thing that, you know, makes somebody not need religion, I think. Right, and yet, at the same time, I could see the religious person being in that society and go, you see, the state's trying to come in and replace God. The state wants to now be God and give you all of these things. And so you'd get some pushback yeah, regard. well, I would ask somebody that says something like that. To, if you know the theory of John Rawls and his, his original position where you, you're put into a world and you don't know what you're going to be in this world, but you know what kind of world it's going to be, what kind of rules would you make? This is the way he constructed his theory of morality. What kind of rules would you make not knowing how you, where you would be placed in this world? Well, I would ask a person that says something like that, well, you know, you might wind up in Saudi Arabia. <laughs> right. Do you want to live in that kind of society where it's a theocracy, or do you want to live in Sweden or Denmark? Well, people are voting with their feet. You can see which way they're going. So, right, right, right. There know. aren't a lot of people moving into Saudi Arabia. No, none. I, mean, I, I, don't, I don't think. Unless they want to fight for, well, not ISIS. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're not, not in Saudi Arabia. Yeah, but, you know. They're exporting people to go fight yeah. ISIS.